is important that we do a proper diagnosis. And that is what today's session is going to focus on. And all of you would have heard each society comes up with their own guidelines. There are innumerable guidelines for screening of the fetal heart. For the cardiologists, we have American Heart Association guidelines. Then radiologists have their guidelines. Then the International Society for Ultrasound in Obstetrics and Gynecology, they have the ISWOC. They have the ISWOC guidelines. Then American Institute of Ultrasound Medicine, AIUM, another popular guideline. But what I'm going to do today is just focus on three views of the heart. The first is, of course, a four-chamber view, which I think everybody should know how to get this. Second is the outflow tracks, the left ventricular and the out, right ventricular outflow tracks, which should be crossing each other like what is shown here. This is a rendered picture, so you can't see the crossing in one single frame. You need two uh, different frames, but we should uh, clearly demonstrate that the LVOT and the RVOT cross each other. And the third view is the three-vessel view. And an extension of the three-vessel view is called a three-vessel tracheal view or the 3BT view. So we have the four-chamber view, the outflow tracks, which is LVOT, RVOT, and the three-vessel and the 3BT view. So these are clubbed together as three uh, unique views for the fetal heart. First step is the four-chamber view. Of course, uh, for the purists, they will argue with me that there is something else before you even look at the heart, that is the abdominal situs. Yes, I of course do that and we should do that. But I'm just talking from a very, very basic perspective of a lot of people who are listening to me who can simply fall, simplify the whole process and make sure that the, one, the anomalies which we should not miss are not missed. So the four-chamber view is a very, very important view of the fetal heart. The specific reason why I say so is because the four-chamber view can be used to separate heart defects, which can be offered complete correction by way of surgery after birth. If there are two ventricles, then all those defects can be corrected with good results. However, if there is a hypoplasia of one of the ventricles or one of the atrioventricular valves, then you are looking at a very complex heart defect. And these are, cannot be offered a complete surgical correction. They can only be palliated. So that means that they need multiple procedures and hence their long-term results are less than optimal. So that's the reason why the four-chamber view has got a great prognostic value as far as the evaluation of fetal heart is concerned. Now, when I list out the four-chamber anomalies, so this is something which for the theoretical aspect uh, for people, students who are listening, we can actually have a nice clear approach. Uh, when you look at the four-chamber view, you need to look at different parts of the four-chamber view to make sure that you don't miss anything. So on the left side, the left heart anomalies, the most important and the most severe one is a hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Then you have aortic stenosis, and then we have an entity called ventricular disproportion or asymmetry, where one ventricle, typically the left one, is a bit smaller than the right. So we will discuss the differential diagnosis of that with hypoplastic left heart very soon. On the right hand side, right side of the heart, you have abnormalities of the tricuspid valve, typically causing tricuspid regurgitation. Then we have this entity called pulmonary atresia with intact ventricular septum. Some people also call it hypoplastic right heart syndrome. And then we have tricuspid atresia. Then the third group is septum defects and the abnormalities of the crux of the heart. And of this most common and the most significant one is atrioventricular septal defect. ASD and VSD are not perhaps so important in the fetal life because, you know, it's something which is some, totally correctable. So the focus is perhaps not on picking a small uh, VSDs and, uh, in the fetus. Uh, congenitally corrected transposition or CCTGA has got a very distinctive four-chamber view uh, variation. So we'll uh, just uh, mention that as well. Then we have intracavitary lesions, of which we have most important group is the cardiac tumors, and typically multiple cardiac tumors uh, called rhabdomyomas. A very common problem is echogenic focus, which uh, this I'm not going to cover because of lack of time. Then you look at area around the heart for pericardial effusion, area behind the heart, which we will be seeing in one of these uh, cases towards the end of the lecture. Then abnormal cardiac rhythm, which is going to be covered in my next lecture, and abnormal contractility, which is essentially cardiac function and which is not be covered in this lecture. So essentially, I'll be talking about left heart anomalies, right heart anomalies, and septal defects 
in this group of uh, four chamber anomalies so let us first start with the most obvious uh, anomalies which is the left heart abnormalities so in this i'm going to show you three examples uh, hyperplastic left heart syndrome aortic stenosis and uh, asymmetry or disproportion of the left heart structures so first uh, let us see this picture and uh, this is actually a movie so sometimes uh, in these sessions in peak hours there could be a slow running movie nevertheless even if you see the picture it should be all right watch this picture carefully and since it's a webinar and uh, I'm relying on internet uh, for getting this data across. I mark all the uh, pictures as left and right. L is left and uh, the R is uh, right. So you can see also the small, uh, uh, the, 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 the icon on top, which is showing anterior, posterior, left and right as well, just to orient you. And this is the color of the same uh, picture, the uh, same uh, lesion. So in this case, we can see that the left side of the heart, particularly the left ventricle, over here is really small, LV is small. And as we see in this uh, color flow, there is no filling of the left ventricle at all. The entire blood which is coming to the left atrium goes across the foramen ovale to the right atrium and then to the right ventricle. So obviously this is a very severe condition and this is what is called hyperplastic left heart syndrome. And when we go to the three vessel view in color of the same lesion, the pulmonary artery is marked as PA and iota is marked as AO. And you can see that in the PA, we see the blue flow, which is flow away from the heart towards the pulmonary artery. While in the iota, we see a retrograde flow, that is blood flowing back into the iota through the ductus arteriosus. And this signifies that there is a complete atresia of the aortic valve. And thus the flow into the iota is completely sort of uh, uh, maintained by the ductus arteriosus. This is also shown very elegantly in the uh, sagittal view of the aortic arch. The AA is ascending iota, D is the ductus arteriosus, and we can see that the entire blood flow into the aortic iota is retrograde and not anterograde. And these features suggest a critical circulation after birth, uh, and uh, which is dependent on the patency of the ductus arteriosus. So these two images uh, clearly tell a very severe uh, end of the spectrum, perhaps the most extreme uh, type of heart defect, which is hyperplastic left heart syndrome. Now, there is a specific entity. Now, in the previous picture, I showed that the only way blood can exit the left atrium in hyperplastic left heart syndrome is through the foramen ovale. And in this picture, we can see that the foramen ovale is actually intact. There is no uh, opening at all. And in fact, you can see that the foramen ovale is bulging towards the right side. And uh, in this case, when you look at the pulmonary veins, as seen by the arrows, you can see that they are quite chunky. They're very big, fat pulmonary veins. The reason is because the mitral valve is atritic. So blood cannot go from the left atrium to the left ventricle. So the only exit path was the foramen ovale, and that too is restrictive. So the blood cannot exit the left atrium. Left atrial pressure will increase, and the back pressure will reflect on the pulmonary veins, causing dilatation and engorgement and this can be identified using him uh, by pulse wave doppler and if you put normal pulse wave doppler into the pulmon pulmonary vein this is what you see you see a uh, uh, systolic waves there are two waves the s wave and the d wave and a very small atrial reversal wave which is shown by this arrow however if you have hyperplastic left heart syndrome with restrictive foramen ovale the pulmonary vein pressure is high and now you look at the atrial reversal wave here, it's very, very prominent. That's because the pressure is very high and in atrial systole, the blood will reflux back into the pulmonary veins, causing a prominent air reversal. This is a bit high end, but um, it's uh, worth looking. It's a very simple thing to do. And um, just using Doppler to look at the pulmonary veins and it's useful in many other conditions as well. And uh, this suggests a very severe end of the spectrum. So that's about hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Now let us see another case. Again, the left and the right are marked for you. And uh, you can see that the left side ventricle is small, while the right side ventricle is quite large. But how do you differentiate this picture from the hyperplastic left heart syndrome, which you saw before? So in this, the left ventricle, even though it's small, continues to form the apex of the heart. 
while in hypoplastic left heart syndrome the left ventricle is so small that it doesn't form the apex of the heart the right ventricle forms the apex of the heart in hlhs so in ventricular disproportion one factor which differentiates the uh, anatomy is that the lv continues to form the apex of the heart while in hypoplastic left heart syndrome the rv will be apex forming and also the second factor is that when you look at the squeeze the contractility in this condition the ventricle still contracts while in hypoplastic left heart syndrome the ventricle is often hypocontracted the second feature is by color doppler and here we are putting the color doppler and as we can see here in hypoplastic left heart syndrome there is no flow across the mitral valve there is typically mitral atresia so all the blood from the left atrium has to go across the foramen ovale to the right atrium however in uh, ventricular disproportion the mitral valve is patent and as we can see here in this uh, movie the blood will flow from the left atrium to the left ventricle so many a time when you see a smallish left ventricle you have this tendency to label this condition as hypoplastic left heart syndrome and please do not do that because the meaning of hlhs is very severe the prognosis is bad while a ventricular asymmetry is often a very common condition particularly in the third trimester of pregnancy and if you label it as hypoplastic left heart syndrome you are implying a very poor prognosis and that is wrong and then the decisions may be taken in a very inappropriate manner so these clues should uh, help you in making the distinction between a true hypoplastic left ventricle versus a disproportionate left ventricle now i'm just going to show this uh, single uh, slide for aortic stenosis because i'm uh, this is uh, obviously the left and the right ventricles are marked and in this uh, movie you can see that the left ventricle is in fact quite severely dilated and when you look at the contractility the lv is hardly moving the right ventricle is moving well contracting well but the left ventricle is dysfunctional and if you look carefully there are bright patches on the ventricular septum suggesting endocardial fibroelastosis as well the reason is that as we can see here the left ventricular outflow tract there is a severe stenosis of the aortic valve there is some anti grade flow but the valve is severely stenotic now i don't want to dwell more into the management options here this is these are situations where some people uh, perform in utero intervention by doing a in utero aortic valve dilatation this of course a very major procedure and uh, we will have to talk about this in a different kind of a setting